Off top, got a special guest for you. Better stick around. Play the music. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. All right, so we sat down to do this podcast, and then the Don Van Nada piece drops, and we're like, all right, let's throw out everything because we're going to talk about this all day. Then we sat down and actually started doing the podcast, and somebody just walked into the studio, and then we're like, you know what? Let's start this all over again again. So we are joined, as usual, by Charlie Kravitz and... The great Bomani Jones is the guy who stumbled into the studio, and I couldn't have asked for a better person to talk about this with because as serious as some of this subject matter is, he going to make it fun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm doing a very poor job of vacation, so there's a certain <laughs> irony that I'm going to spend my vacation making your job fun. But I'm here, baby. <laughs> I'm here to do this. It's the first time I've been on the Dominique Fosbury show. I just know that I get to return the favor. This what's up. I would love to have you more often, but I hate asking people for stuff. But mm. Hey, keep it up. Keep it up. <laughs> keep it up. <laughs> You're doing a good job. All right, so here it is. The piece is about John Gruden's being fired, essentially. And it goes a bunch of different places It's pretty much about a bunch of different people trying to use media leaks to enact the change or the protection that they want from either side. So, Charlie, where do you want to start? Okay. So, the way I think we should do this, let's go point by point, the main takeaways. Like a table of contents. Yeah, I'll give you a table of contents. You stop me whenever there's something that's interesting that you guys want to discuss. It's better than a table of contents. It's the abstract. Yeah, that's right. I'm giving, I'm giving us the treatment of this article. <laughs> so, the one sheet. Yep. So the main purpose of this, I think, is connecting two timelines. How John Gruden was forced out by the NFL, how that information became public, and how that connects to the downfall of Dan Snyder. So this is going to start with Gruden and will end up with Snyder. But the first thing in all of this, this feels like we're in succession. This actually <laughs> feels like this is something that Kendall Roy and Hugo would do of how this information got out there. But we're going to start with how the information of John Gruden being racist was leaked. Okay. So and this it goes a, to the New York Times. Yeah. It was an email leak where he called Demora Smith, the executive director of the NFL Players Association, rubber lips, which is an obvious racial slur. No, he said he had lips like Michelin tires. Oh, that's right. Yes. Rub, that's, rubber lips rubber, was the justification. Yes, just, that's right. That was, that was his. Uh, Don't Morris Smith, <laughs> D-U-M-B-O-R-R-I-S. Because yeah. he thought his, he thought Morris was like Morris the cat. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that was it. He said he had lips like Michelin tires, which he tried to then say he called them rubber lips because that's... Because he'd be lying. Because he'd be lying, which was his his Hail Mary attempt at getting out of trouble, which failed. So Almost that worked. Happened. Yeah, it did almost work. It almost work. worked. It almost, it, until it, the second leaks. It only worked unless you, if you wanted it to. <laughs> yep. And most people wanted <laughs> correct, it to. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. Good we, enough for me. <laughs> Mark Davis included initially. <laughs> wanted I knew it, it to. I, I knew it had to be something. <laughs> All right, so... Pick it back up, Charlie. Okay. So this story goes through the people who could have started leaking this information. And it starts with a source that's saying Demora Smith was bragging about the leak because it was at a time when he might have been voted out as head of the NFL PA. And he was then elected later that day. So I was on executive committee when Demora Smith first was hired into the um that role as executive director. So just to be like, I have a relationship with him and relationships with plenty of other people in his story. Uh, a lot of things about Demora Smith in this story and previous stories make me a little uncomfortable with being associated with bringing him into the league. And like, I like him personally and all that stuff. But one of the other things, one of the people or the groups that are believed to have been a part of this, of getting Demora Smith protection when he's up for election is also the NFL owners because it's suggested in this piece and other pieces by Don Vaynada that the league loves what Demora Smith has done and has helped them to, to um, shape the future of collective bargaining agreements in their favor. One of the more stinging indictments Ugh. one could have as the leader of a union. It's a tough place. I mean, we could have a, a different yeah. episode about unions. And but this feels different than the way Tag Lee Boo felt about Upshaw, though, yeah. right? Where they was kind of like, yo, we in this together for shepherding the league. It felt like they was like, we got this dude. Yeah, and that's why they brought, that's part of the reason why they brought um, Roger Goodell in is because the owners were not happy with the relationship between Tag Lee Boo and Upshaw. And I think one of the things that we could say about this union and unions going forward, and again, I am part of the problem, is when you hire outside like that and you hire people who are come from a corporate world, which I thought at the time, obviously, was a 
the right thing to do. Um, and I'm not saying that it's the wrong thing to do, but when you start to do that, the alignment and the relationships and the way that they look at things are very different than if you hire someone who has been through it. Like Gene Upshaw was a player. Gene Upshaw was not interested in being nobody's uh, friend or cooperating. And I'm not saying obviously that DeMora Smith was interested in doing that, but it's more likely to, to, to have that. And then other leagues, sub subsequent unions have followed in the same suit. Um, and the NBA Players Association hired Michelle Roberts. And then they then, uh, they from her, they go to Tremaglia, who is a consultant. But that's a tangent for another conversation. My bad. Oh, no, you good. <laughs> so the other person who was rumored to be in this league, there are four sources who said that Goodell and the league office was passing along this information. Um, that has been... What's the motive? The motive here, and we should get here, is because John Gruden and Roger Goodell hated each other. Yo, that was stunning. <laughs> the levels to which... Yes. And by the way, I felt where John Gruden was coming from all this, but we'll get there. Yeah. So John Gruden said that he that Goodell was anti football, all of the head the concussion stuff. He wanted to burn it all down, and this goes all the way back to the inception of the Raiders. This is two commissioners past. If we go back to it, this is Al Davis and Pete Rozelle having a feud over Al Davis thinking that the league blocked a John Elway trade to the Raiders <laughs> because they were a renegade franchise. Hold on. It yeah. goes all the way back to Al Davis not being named the commissioner yes. of the N It is the NFL and the AFL, and they came together to be the NFL, and somehow AFL Al Davis thought he was going to be in charge. And he was only the commissioner for six weeks yeah. before the merger. <laughs> yeah. And you say somehow he I thought he was going to be. it was yeah. only six yeah. weeks. Yeah, it was it's six or eight, but it was it was a short period of time. He had, But when you, that sounds ridiculous, but when you know things about Al Davis like you and I know about Al Davis, he might have been able to pull that move off because he has pulled off some moves in his day. Yeah, he didn't lose. He just ran out of time. <laughs> so the, the history of the league's relationship with the Raiders is always been contentious. I think it was in 1980 that the Raiders were the first team to want to move their franchise. They sued, uh, had an antitrust lawsuit against the league, which they won. And then it subsequently has worked out better for all leagues because they then used that lever for them going forward. It's funny how that always works out that suing the league works out in their advantage. Must be nice to be that powerful and yes. rich. This is one of the morals of the story is yeah. that billionaires usually get what they want. Yeah. So anyway, um, that Al Davis passed that hatred on to to his son, and the organization still is yeah, always. But at he also with passed it directly to John Gruden. To, to yes, John Gruden. Yes. 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 Fair. It was. It seemed to be an organizational tenet yes. that John Gruden <laughs> upheld. Um, so there's one more point of this before we have to sort of jump timelines, and that was this is all going on during the COVID season. I guess John Gruden and the Raiders did not follow all of the COVID restrictions, and they received a massive fine. John Gruden personally, <laughs> he paid the fine, to which, and I, I'm going to quote here, uh, Sean Payton told John Gruden, I never paid the fine. You're the only dumb that paid the fine <laughs> so Which, fanning Sean, the flames here Sean Payton had a fine from Bounty Gate yes right so anyway proceed okay so now we have to jump back a tiny bit of timeline uh, in the timeline because this is the first batch of emails that we just talked about was the racist emails from John Gruden but now we need to hop back a little bit to understand why Rock Nation is involved in this <laughs> Rock Nation is involved in the NFL's marketing arm because they brought him in more or less to uh, be the ask a black guy in the right. racial so reckoning to be clear, post Colin Kaepernick. In case you don't know, Rock Nation is Jay-Z's company. Yes. And so if you remember when the Kaepernick stuff was happening, many of us were very critical of the league because it's just openly doing racist stuff. And then we were also critical of them just trying to like slap a black face on this to solve it. But as uh, you and I have talked about before, Charlie, they weren't trying to appeal to us. They wanted... They were starting the, the their problem with race had gotten so big that even like mainstream America, air quotes, who they normally are talking to was like, oh, is the NFL racist? And how do you solve a perception problem about re being racist? You go find a famous black dude and stand next to him. Yes. Now, in the conversations I'd had with people about this, when this deal first went down, though, people were adamant. Rock Nation was trying to like somebody had bought a company that had the Super Bowl contract, like the Super Bowl halftime deal or whatever. And then it was like, oh, well, why don't we try to make something happen? I am not sure that they were smart enough to say, hey, Jay-Z, fix our problem. And somebody was like, hey, 
if Jay-Z and them are calling us about this other thing, what if he'll go do this, you know, do this for yeah. us? And of course, Jay-Z was like, ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> and then go do it. They framed yes. they framed it in the piece as pretty much Robert Kraft yes. just being like, yeah, hey, come over and help us out with this. But uh, as as I learned from you, Bomani, they actually forced the league into like approaching some pretty radical organizations. So while they did, and the reason why they they were kind of forced into doing that is because they made the mistake that some businesses make is you go and get only one buyer. And when you get one buyer, that means that they have so much power. So as it's outlined in this article, they could not have a reputation for being a racist organization and then have a falling out with the black face they hired. Yes. So then that group then has a lot more power and leverage to force you to do and say and behave yes. in ways that you can't because you can't show up the next day like, yeah, we got a Kaepernick problem and we got a Jay-Z problem. And one thing about Jay-Z, he friend with, with rich white people too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Like he served that purpose for a lot of people. Yeah, he does. All right. So- where this connects to the John Gruden story is Desiree Perez, the CEO of Rock Nation Sports. And the second batch of emails that leaked to the New York Times, it is rumored in this piece or sourced or somewhat sourced rumors that she may have leaked the second batch of emails that painted John Gruden also using homophobic slurs. This is what got Mark Davis to actually sort of force John Gruden to resign. He was at that point employing Carl Nassib and owned a WNBA team and didn't want to be associated with it. John Gruden realized his time was up and he resigned. Your friendly reminder, racism. <laughs> you can beat that. You, the you, 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 you can beat that. He looked up and was like, because he called him. Remember yeah. that report first came out and it said that he called Goodell a slur or an unmentionable or something like that, but they didn't tell us which one it was. And then we found out what it was. And then Mark Davis was like, oh, no, this one. Bridge too far and I know it. They knew we was just going to let the other one slide. That's a whole nother, again. A whole that's nother a, discussion. That's a whole nother discussion. And maybe it's just about the fact that there are no white people who are black. Yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are white people who are gay well, and so uh, this is this is the tricky space that a certain comedian who was going about it the wrong oh, way yeah, is trying yeah. to get to ah uh, david yeah. all right so i wanted to rewind one thing because this is not important for us to talk about but i think it was something that people would find interesting mm -hmm. desiree per perez i've met her a couple of times i like her she's nice she's very successful a very highly respected uh entertainment bigwig However, this piece also points out that she got a pardon from Trump because she had cocaine charges and she was an informant. I don't know where any way to go with that, but I thought it was something that needed to be said. Yeah, I saw that detail and was just kind of like, huh, I wonder if that's in her corporate bio. <laughs> Right, or they just they just like 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 I didn't know how I was supposed to feel. She used to run dope, but then she started snitching, and then in the end, she got a pardon from Trump. And I have no idea how I'm supposed to feel about her. And she's also been very effective and successful as a woman of color in an industry. So it's like nobody is a one thing. But I, yeah, I, I'm certainly not going to get up here and defend people who sell drugs. But I do understand. Uh, I use my wife's family as an example. When you don't have other opportunities, sometimes you do that. So like my wife's parents and all the people at that age, at, at the grandparent age right now, all doctors, lawyers, professors. My wife's dad or my wife's granddad, he was a number runner. He's Joe Kennedy. Yeah. So like that, essentially, when there are fewer opportunities, which there are, there were for black people then, and there are for black people and women now, sometimes you go a little different route. Again, a whole yeah. nother podcast for a whole nother time for probably a whole nother network. Sorry about that, yes. Charlie. What's next? I'm not going to be the one cutting you off there, but what's next? <laughs> How does this connect to Daniel Snyder and his downfall with, with the Washington R words? Um, it connects because while this timeline was going on, Dan Snyder was also being investigated for dozens of untoward sexual deviant actions in, with his organization, whether it was sexual assault, sexual harassment, a hostile workplace for cheerleaders. The list goes on and on. These emails with John Gruden were with Bruce Allen, the president of the Washington R Words at that time, that were given to the league during this investigation and then leaked. Um and this gets to probably the most interesting detail. While this was going on, Dan Snyder was probably going to get away with this investigation that we droned on and on about, and the league didn't know what to do, and the owners were protecting him until he brought out a blackmail PowerPoint. 
He went to the league to the league meetings with a PowerPoint of screenshots <laughs> and details of other owners doing terrible things. Clear and- out. Clear out. <laughs> yes. Clear out. Bo Monty Jones. I when I read this article. <laughs> I just imagined what he was thinking as the only person in the room Ugh. who knew what this PowerPoint was about to be. Right? They're like, all right, and now for a presentation from Mr. Snyder. And he break out that remote control and he hit that boop boop. And he's up there and it is all not explicit. Yeah. The article makes the point that he was simply trying to say that there was a measure of hypocrisy right. in attacking him for these things, given some of the things that were in these emails, but everybody in the room took it for exactly what it was, a, a shot across the bow. Oh. And by the way, that shot landed yes. because right. Roger Goodell saw that and was like, oh, shit, he's crazy, <laughs> right? Like, there's nothing like that moment in any of these interactions, and I think we all get there. When you realize there's one person in this room that's crazier yeah. than anybody else, and he will burn this whole thing down. And Snyder is not a, most people that have is you're like, nah, he ain't gonna do that. That would be counterproductive. No, sir. Worst case scenario for Snyder, sell the team, get six billion dollars is what it ultimately turned into. He put up and they and when Charlie said blackmail PowerPoint, that is how it was referred Literally, to yes. by league people as blackmail PowerPoint. But can you imagine everybody else in the room when they saw that? And Dan <laughs> Snyder being like, <laughs> So anybody got any questions? <laughs> there are two things that are I think are important here. There's a, another business lesson to be learned from this. Number one is you need to always present people with a graceful exit in every situation because when you corner somebody, you you believe I'm going to beat them down so much that they're going to walk away with the tail between their legs. But also what can happen when you corner somebody, they ain't got nothing to lose. I heard yes. a, um, a, a comedian making a joke a couple days ago. Um, I forgot the guy's name, but he's he spent a lot, a lot of time in prison. And he was saying, like, how the prison, prison guards. Ali Sadiq. Yeah, Ali Sadiq. How the prison guards said, like, demeaned him. And he had so long in jail that he was like, I don't care. I don't have to go home. And that's what Dan Snyder was up there like, hey, I don't. I don't have to go home, but we might make you all pay the price. That's the first thing. The second thing that's a little bit more fun and more interesting is when you were talking about Bomani, I was thinking, how did he deliver this? <laughs> and is, there's one of two ways. One is with a laser pointer and you can talk through the things. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, hey, you don't hey, think it was hey, a finger on hey, a stick, hey, yeah. like the little, or or you had a finger on the stick where he's like, "Hey, hey, Jerry, wake up! This, <laughs> this your slide, baby." There's that move, and then the other one is a slightly more cool move where you just let that thing play. Yeah, the Larry, the Larry Bird. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> he pressed play and just held it like this. Yep, you just there. You go. You just cross your legs and let it play. And as you said at the end. Turn the lights on, <laughs> and you say, any questions? Yo, I got to say, of all the things out of this story, <laughs> if there's anything that should make you respect Dan Snyder, just, just a little bit, just a little bit, it's that one right there. I want to know who else is in the room. I want to know who the one person was that was like, right? <laughs> there's somebody that wanted to fight him, right? Because there's somebody who just ain't going for this. Oh, and man. I guess... If I had to guess who would be the one that wanted to fight him, it is the man who might tell him that he would work him on the inside. Yes, yes, like, 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 I, I don't yes, think Jerry yeah. is taking kindly to uh, be a oh, strong yeah. guard. Oh, uh, yeah. And he turned on. But yeah, I, I think we know Ursay too. Yeah, Ursay. I, I, but Ursay is, is a guy who was backed into a corner generally. But he also powerlifting Ursay. Yeah, yeah. But my point with Ursay is he ain't scared of your PowerPoint. Yeah. Ursay been through the mud. Yes. He, don't, he ain't scared of you, which is why he spoke out. But um, we haven't decided. I think the right way to do it is just press play. It's the most cin- cinematic way. You yes. just press play, and then you hit him with any questions. Although, I would certainly enjoy someone going through. Can you read that? Is that large <laughs> enough for you? Yeah. yeah. Are, we, anybody, are, we, are we good? Ready? Yeah. Next slide. Next slide. This word here? <laughs> yeah, no, this Hold is on. a racist epithet, just in case y'all didn't know. Yo, at what point was somebody like, we don't need to see no more slides? <laughs> oh, but you do. You <laughs> 
in particular. Hey, 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 who, who's that over there? Spanos? Look up. <laughs> Sit on down. Yeah. Sit on down, Dean. Yeah, so I, say, I, don't, I mean, to be fair, I got to be careful throwing the names out because I don't yeah, know yeah, I mean, who done actually said what. But yeah. at the same time, hey there, trucker man. <laughs> you looking at Jimmy Haslam. Exactly. Well, who's next on the Summer Jam screen? He looking at everybody. They're all like, is, is it about to be you? Is it about to be you? Oh, uh, Arthur Blank. Uh, out here building houses for poor people, huh? Whoa, 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 whoa. Sit on down, Mob Deep. We ain't done with <laughs> To prodigy <laughs> or habit. Sit your ass down. Don't worry, y'all got six or something like that. <laughs> Oh, like, I imagine he ended this. We know he does not like being called Dan. Oh. He he ended this PowerPoint with the slide that said, and it's Mr. Snyder to you. Ooh. I guarantee <laughs> Any questions? All right. What's so, next? And, and we haven't even gotten to the point about the amorphous suspension yet, right? Oh, this is what it leads to. <gasps> okay, is that okay, it worked? Just check it because honestly, we could have stayed on this point for 30 well, minutes. <laughs> this worked because he, he went full Pablo Escobar. He got to build his own prison. He yes. got to turn his mansion into a prison. It was a $10 million fine. And he thought he was going to be suspended from league meetings for one month. While still going to games. And the fact that it dragged on longer is how it connects to Gruden. Because, because was the, the key here, he wasn't ever actually officially suspended. Yeah, like right. when it was oh, announced, it was, he away. would step away from the team for months, nice. they said. And Snyder didn't hear that S. Yeah. <laughs> he just thought it was month. <laughs> so he thought it was going to be one month. And it gets to November that year. And this is where he thought, oh, Roger Goodell, John Gruden. They hate each other. I can turn over... All of these emails, right. and this is just going to burn John Gruden and give me more credibility with the league. But it was one of the things that backfired immensely, or we think it backfired immensely, because the second he threw another organization out of the bus and used another NFL owner and their team as collateral damage, it pulled off the gloves and let all of the other team owners basically be like, F you, this guy, we are done with Daniel Snyder. Well, they and, had to be. I think yeah. that's the other part. Once he got up there and got them all shook, they were like, okay, you got it. We right. good. And then he actually did something. Exactly. Now it's like, look, either he going to get us all exactly. or we got to all jump him. And that was the point. It was like at, at, he seemed like a desperate but rational person that they were like, all right, we can work with this guy. But then he just started shooting shots. He just started licking off shots. And he was like, oh, he might hit us. We right. got to get him up out of here. And the other part being – he seemed to he he hates Bruce Allen now. Yeah, he did not always hate Bruce Allen, yeah. but now they loved hate him. each other. He loved Bruce right. Allen for years. Right, all those guys that had that right hand man job. Vinny Serrato was the one yeah. that had it before. People told me they were like brothers. Right, yeah. it was like that with Bruce Allen, and then one day it wasn't like that with Bruce Allen anymore. And then we I don't know if we define who Bruce Allen. Oh, sorry, yeah, Bruce Allen, former team president, also of note, son of George Allen, former Washington Aras coach, which I had imagined was a big part of Snyder's affection for him, because Snyder in the end, which yeah. you cannot forget, big fan. there is no bigger fan of this team than him. It's the most ironic part of the whole thing. Right. And so Bruce Allen was the guy who who uh, was emailing back and forth with John Gruden that had the, the yes, slurs. Because they were buddies. Us, yeah, yeah. From the Raiders days. All yeah. right. And I guess that's really where this story closes, but with the basic tagline of why this all worked is that forcing billionaire Dan Snyder to do something he didn't want to do was really the only punishment that worked yeah. at all. Is removing him from the club and being like, you can't be included. That was what pushed it over the edge. But I think there's another part of the story that's very important, and it's the end of it. And it doesn't feel nearly as momentous as the stuff early. But when they mm -hmm. start getting into the beef with John Gruden and uh, Roger Goodell, something I found to be fascinating in that was, in all that time that John Gruden was the voice of Monday Night Football, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. he met Roger Goodell one time. And the one time they met, to quote uh, the late, great Frankie Five Aces, he's got me waiting in a lobby. Yep. 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 There was a meeting to talk about youth football, which John Gruden cares a lot about. And Goodell was going to be there. The only time he heard from Goodell was Goodell. This was actually I totally got why Gruden was so mad. Gruden was so frustrated with the league after a helmet-to-helmet -helmet call. He's like, I don't know what the league office is doing on player safety. And Goodell tried to get him on the phone, whatever, I forget who the two people were, so they could explain player safety right. to John Gruden. He was like, how dare you? And so the one time they ever met in person, Roger Goodell had him waiting, 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 came in, shook his hand, and walked out. And so Gruden is suing about his contract right. for obvious reasons, but they make a very important point. He's won every motion yep. he's filed, and his defense is going to be look at everybody's emails. Because if you look at everybody's Whew. emails, you won't be able to justify firing <sighs> him because basically you'd have to fire everybody else. 
I don't know why the NFL is still fighting this. They are going to pay him every dime of this money. And and the NFL was supposed to release all those emails. That was one of the things that was supposed to come out from the Washington investigation that got swept under the rug while all of this was yes, going but on. Yes, but Snyder yeah. and all the stuff that when he strong-armed them, because yeah. uh, Beth Wilkinson, yeah. who ran that investigation, had promised all these people who had talked to her that the whole report would be out, Public, all right. this information yeah. would be out, and Snyder, bless his heart, he made it happen. <laughs> yeah, they did it. The, there is no report. It was a, a oral report to make sure that there was no track record for them to point to or no um, no uh, documents for people to, to get. But... <clears throat> The reason why they're dragging out this potential trial is my guess is John Gruden got a big settlement on his mind and he's, <laughs> is, he is settling for more than what his contract <laughs> is worth. And you know what? If he gets anywhere close to discovery, anywhere close to it, huh? <laughs> they gonna pay that man so many dollars to and that's sad it's hilarious but it, it is sad think of this story and who are all the winners and no, who are all the losers but this is a big thing that's worth noting for this john gruden thing and i think it's very important like when people understanding left wing and right wing american politics when it comes to race right what we got here is something very fundamentally important with that and so this is the thing by and large in politics Race is a discussion that white people are having amongst right. themselves. And whenever you listen to the right wing pushback against the left, it all fundamentally comes down to, oh, y'all ain't no better than us. And you know it. <laughs> that's like that's really what it really gets to. And John Gruden is playing that card right there. Oh, you're going to act like it's just me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He know it ain't just him. <laughs> he know who he been talking to. He knows what kind of stuff is flying around there, back and forth or whatever. And he's like, cool, let's all do it then. Y'all don't wreck me. And I know why he's doing it. I talked to one guy who played for Gruden in Tampa. And you know guys who used to play for John Gruden. They don't like him. Yeah. Right? He is not well-liked by yeah. his four. Even the guys that won a Super Bowl with him. Yeah. Not well-liked. One of them I talked to, he was like, I'll tell you that John Gruden is arrogant and egotistical and this and that. He went through like eight terrible adjectives, comma, but I never thought he was in, I never thought he was a racist. Like there's a long line of guys that played for him who would say that. So he firmly believes this, whether or not it's true. Never mind you being the guy that hired Nolan Naraki, right? Mm -hmm. Never Mm -hmm. mind you being the Kirk Ferentz of the NFL where you the one that got the most white dudes on the team out of anybody else. But also coincidentally, Find some beasts that other people seem to overlook, <laughs> yeah. right? Like all those things. He is that guy, and he's like, we all gonna go, we all gonna do this together. What? You, you know how I know that that he has uh, that it's not an empty threat is the fact that the original email exists in the first place. Yes, that's not something that you put in the email if you are concerned <laughs> about how you're gonna come across. Right. Yeah. There are people who talk like that and people who talk worse. And that's how I know that John Gruden gonna get every yeah. green skin that he <laughs> want from them and some, and then a tax yes. on top for and, wasting his time. And you know who's not gonna be in any of those emails? Who? Dan Snyder. Because <laughs> he don't use email. That tell you everything you need to know about that man right there. He's West India Archie of the NFL. <laughs> Keep it all right here. Amazing so, point. Who's who's um Malcolm Little in that scenario? Who did he like? Who is the person he tried to tell this to? Is it Bruce oh, Allen? Is it Bruce Allen? It might be. <laughs> all right, hey, hey, keep it all up here, buddy. Keep it all up here. And then didn't. Yeah. Anyway, I don't know. There is no proper way to end this because this conversation is not going to end just because we turned the cameras off. But y'all don't get to listen to the rest of this. Man, this is. It was. I was reading it on the train as I was coming down. I was like, oh, this is in the thrawling at every every turn i still felt like the rock nation stuff they just throwing them in there like i heard they might have told them too because this is what i want to know if rock nation was doing the leaking how jay-z got so much power that they letting them look at the emails (laughs) yes ridiculous unless they said unless it was yo we need to ask the black people what they think about this the weird thing about this story to me is if they chose any one of the people or entities uh, that are accused of leaking this, if they chose any one of them, they have enough cooperation and support to be like this, mm-hmm. the group that did it. Yes. But the fact of the matter is, it turned into, as they use in a piece, a circling fire squad that there is so much like 
evidence and support for each group that it feels like no one is it's not going to hang on anyone like who is the person who actually did the but physical leaking it's an interesting prisoner's dilemma right yeah. if i'm yeah. getting a little nerdy with it so if people are unfamiliar with the prisoner's dilemma it's a ga- it's a game theory concept okay you got two people Great they got concept. they got locked yeah, up yeah. for a crime right everybody's better off if they stay quiet but if you stay quiet and the other person talks you take the whole weight Therefore, people are incentivized to talk, even though it's actually counter to their own interests. If everybody could just stay in line. And I feel like that's what happened here. Maybe everybody's better off keeping it quiet, but also everybody could figure out a way where if I talk, I might be the one to come out on top. Right. And so everybody talks, <laughs> but a- it saves them in this case where nobody officially goes down right. because it looks like anybody could have talked. It does. And it does. It, it kind of strikes me as feeling like they this was. You never want to involve a bunch of different people when you're doing something like this, but it also feels like all these groups gave this the okay. Yes. It was kind of a wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And I don't know who's the person who actually had to deliver the envelope, but it seemed like all the groups were comfortable with it. By the way, worth noting that before Josh Harris bought the commanders, it does strongly seem like the NFL wanted Jay-Z to be the face that bu- ended up buying the team, which yeah, is yeah. probably why this was also in- included ah, in the leaking. Also fair. Let's also get back to, we talked about this a little, but still, my favorite, one of my favorite moments in the story, we have a problem. That's what they said when they called Mark Davis yes. after they had staved off the racism allegation. They found out about this one, because look, you can make the argument that it's about the use of the homophobic slur. Mm -hmm. But there's also, he didn't just use that homophobic slur about somebody. He didn't use it about the head of the players union. Mm -mm. He said it about the boss of the bosses. Yep. And the the relationships always matter. Excuse me. Relationships always matter. And we don't talk about that very much. I think we, and Bomani enters, ironically, I guess, you're an economist, but you managed to realize that not everybody is responding to incentives. Yes. And I think so many of us look at these situations and these big organizations and big decisions, and this is something I've been harping on for a long time, is they're not as smart as you think they are. Like, this is all about relationships, and sometimes they do strategically smart things. But don't hurt my feelings. Yo, <laughs> what it comes down to is you hurt my feelings, and I'm going to straighten you out. Yo, it's funny when you talk about, like, the ability to do this job, right? Like, I was thinking about it with the Rock Nation woman. Okay. From what I can tell, it seems that she had gotten up to some places in the dope game because otherwise yeah. her snitching information would not have been particularly valuable, right? right? Mm-hmm. Look, getting up there in the dope game, they ain't a lot of incompetent people exactly. who managed to rise in the dope game. Everybody's basically selling the same thing, right? Like for you to get to the top, you got to have a skill and a whole lot of people are doing it. In the NFL, you're selling dope, and you're the only people who are allowed to sell dope. You don't have to be that good at selling dope if you're the only person who got dope, right? Like, you just got to get some people with some guns, make sure don't nothing go, you know, but you're the only one that got dope. You don't have to be that good. Yeah. And it's 31 people who the only ones selling dope. And and some of them didn't even do the things to get them in the room in the first place. So, like, yes. it's a point, again, a point that I make a lot is that it's a, a legal cartel, so there is not true competition in that if you run your business poorly, it will fail. Whereas if you run a restaurant poorly, it will fail. If your food's not on time, if it's not, bathroom's not clean, it will fail. Here, you can run a crap organization forever, but you're attached to the NFL. So there is not, not to say that these guys are dumb or incompetent or bad business people, but there is no evidence for most of them that they are um, good <laughs> at, at running teams, but uh, there is evidence for Desiree of all the yes. people in here yes. that if you were to pick somebody, you I know, know she earned it. <laughs> I know she earned it. One and way the, or another. The highest stakes. Yes. And while you'll walk away from this thinking, man, Roger Goodell, he sure is so good at doing all these things. He runs the league. He make a lot of money. You know who my number one draft pick yeah. is? It's the one who dominated <laughs> in the toughest league yes. imaginable. Yes, the legend in two games <laughs> is what we talk about here, right? But also to yeah. wrap this up, as we talk about how it ain't that hard to do this, we only really know of one person who, due to incompetence, was leaving money on the table with the team. And it's not Mike Brown who was leaving money on the table for just weird reasons. Yeah. He's not yeah. incompetent. He's just cheap and loved his daddy, mm-hmm. right? Dan Snyder yeah. <laughs> figured out how to not really make that much money yeah. owning a team. O- but- hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Not owning a team. Owning a team in one of the best markets yes. in the country. Yes, but while that was the case, 
He had the finesse and the flex <laughs> to make these people bow down to his will. Mm, everybody make a shot every now and then. <laughs> but he didn't just make Dominique. We just talking about a shot. Yeah. He he walked in there and was like he was on the Larry Bird. Who, who who's getting second place? <laughs> yeah, right. He was like, I'm about to win the three point contest. Mm, mm, watch, mm. watch me work. <sighs> Man, I love this story. Before we sat down, and now I would like to marry. It really it. worked out well that I coincidentally. <laughs> Great timing, incredible today. timing. Yeah, it was a perfect timing. All right, is there anything else? That's it. Thanks, Sarah Abbott. Thanks, Addie Khan. Thank you, Podville Media, and of course, Christina Buswell. Appreciate y'all. This is the Dominique Foxworth Show. 